demand for steam train excursions around the world and in New Zealand this has largely been fueled by the irrepressible passion of one man. This Kiwi was so keen to get steam trains back on the main line that he founded Steam Incorporated and finally Mainline Steam. For this to be possible it required unrelenting pressure on the rail authorities by a select few at the time. This man is still the driving force behind mainline steam excursions around New Zealand and his name is Ian Welsh. My love or my passion has always been steam excursions on the main line where you're not limited just to one section of track. Where, and, and as a result of uh, forming uh, mainline steam, I think most of the engines, our engines have covered literally from not going to say Kai Tai to Bluff, we've certainly been to Bluff and we've been to Oteria, which is the farther, furthest north one could go at that time. So there's not many lines that we haven't been on in New Zealand. That, that, uh, that's what excites me, if you like. Kia ora, I'm Bethany Grace Miller and I'm one of those fortunate enough to be able to experience these steam train excursions. So today I'd love to share a bit about what that's like through a range of films. Not long after setting up Mainline Steam, the Trust began running trips primarily from Auckland where the two operational locomotives were based. This is a story that dates back to 1989, before the era of digital filmmaking. One such trip was to Rotorua to run a series of shuttles up to the historic sawmill at Mamaku. from a trust called the Second Chance Trust. They wanted to run steam uh, over the Christmas period when the tourists, the New Zealand tourists, were in Rotorua. And it's a very, very pretty line. It's a lovely line. So we took the KA up there, and I think we ran for two weeks. The first year was very successful. Uh, the train was popular and it was successful over the two-week period. The next year, the Second Chance Trust decided to run the game. And that time, the director of the trust had decided that Mamaku had a lot more to offer for them. He felt people would be happy to be up there for something like two or three hours. So we run up in the morning. In reality, they literally, a lot just hung around till the train was ready to depart back down to Rotorua. And that year was not successful at all. And I think it was the change of timing. It really meant that the trip occupied people for a full day, or family for a full day. And um, so literally the wheels fell off. Trains were being run up there empty. And that, that, was, a, that was a shame because uh, I think if they had stuck to the original formula, they could have done quite well over that Christmas period. Probably um, a five or six day period. But New Zealand is a small country and limited population. So it is a limited market. I think you've got to tailor whatever you do to size of the market and be a bit realistic with your expectations. We actually got the J running first and we ran, we did quite often trips from Auckland to Rotorua. We used to get down there and give people about two hours in Rotorua and then head back to Auckland. So it was an Auckland Rotorua, Rotorua Auckland trip. KA came on the scene later on. It cost a lot of money to move a steam engine to, or were based at that time in Wellington and Auckland, and it cost a lot of money to move equipment from either Auckland or Wellington to Rotorua. So you've got to be guaranteed a certain amount of patronage or a certain sum of money, which we were by the Second Chance Trust, before you can actually commit yourself to doing it. As I mentioned, that second season was really a disaster. They just ran out of money, that's what it came down to. They didn't get the income. Well, unfortunately, like a lot of these things where debt's involved, it did end up in a court case, and we were ordered to be paid by the courts 
We got a certain sum of money, we didn't get all our money. The trust resurrected itself in another form and we started dealing with new people who were very good to us. We got most of our money back, which I'm pleased to say. You now, a chap called Jim Ross was involved, very ethical man, and he was very determined to you know, make sure the new group started off on a good footing. Their first year, uh, uh, they ran very well, but unfortunately the second re year, um, they ran into a lot of debt. And it appears from the information, because I, I wasn't involved at that time, that the, um, the more experienced railway people tried to tell the then chairman of Second Chance what he should be doing or not doing, but he went, apparently went his own way and uh, finished up owing a hell of a lot of money to both on track and mainline steam. Lessons have been learned. I mean, to be fair to the first lot of people, they got it right the first time and then probably got too enthusiastic and tried to build on that success and altered the formula and then it turned out going all bad. At the moment we're running about every six weeks or eight weeks out of Auckland, trips to the various places. So the more destinations you've got, of course, the more attractive it is to your customers, that's the public. So every time a line closes, that's one less destination you've got to offer, which tends to be quite restrictive. So yes, I'd welcome the line to be open. You know, if it was open from Pataru right through to Rotorua, most definitely we'd be running trips out of Auckland down there. Whether it would be viable in private hands is a moot point. If you own a bit of railway line, there's an awful lot of maintenance involved. It's not only fixing the track that's costly, because the restoration and maintenance of the locomotives themselves are as well. Mainline Steam has a number of full-time engineers across its three depots. However, a large amount of the work is done by a keen group of volunteers. I spoke to Ian recently and he had a lot to say about this team building approach. Would you find that like leading a team to do these things has been rewarding? Oh yeah, definitely. You can't do this on your own. You tend to find other people with similar views to yourself, and, um, and there's a lot of joy in that. There's a lot of joy in communicating with people. Mm, mm. So the team is another massive thing that fuels the the passion. Yeah, like-minded people who get together and um, want to know what you're doing, and they they get involved with you. Absolutely. And, um, and they become part of you, part of part of the team that's doing this work. This has been a major factor in what is undoubtedly the most ambitious restoration project in New Zealand to date. A double-ended locomotive is presently undergoing a major restoration in Mainline Steam's Plymouthton workshops. This locomotive that's here beside me is, is a, a Bayer Garrett. Um, it was imported from, from Rhodesia or Zimbabwe. Um, it is, is close within the gauging of New Zealand that we could get to resemble the Bayer Garrets that ran in New Zealand in the, in the 30s. There were, I think, three, three originally. Um, they weren't overly successful in New Zealand for a number of reasons, and they were converted to a G-class locomotive in the long run. Um, having said that this is close to New Zealand standards, we have had to do a lot of work on it. We've had to lower the boiler because it's actually over height for the New Zealand loading gauge. Um, we've had to modify the cab so that it, uh, it, it fits the, the loading gauge. Um, a number of the pipe work and things for the injectors and everything else underneath it we've had to pull in closer to the underframe so that it uh, meets the gauge. Um, this loco was originally vacuum braked um, and we're replacing that with a, a cross compound um, air brake system similar to all of the other locos in New Zealand. Um, converting it from, from a coal-fired locomotive to an oil-fired locomotive um, and it's been a major exercise. We were very lucky in the early days of having Trevor Heath and his wife out here working on it. Um, they retubed it and did a lot of the preparation work and, and in, in altering this locomotive for the loading gauge, um, what I'm talking about is, is basically what can go through tunnels in New Zealand. And that's what's been the cause of us having to um, 
make the significant alterations to this locomotive to fit it into gauge. What you'll see here is, is this was the original height through here of which the boiler sat on and we've had to, to cut out this section to lower it to this level so there's a good six inches come out of it. Um, that, that is to lower the boiler to get it into the gauge that I've been talking about. Now if you look inside you can see the small tubes are the ones that we've had to replace in this locomotive. They're, they're actually the boiler tubes. The big ones being the, the uh, flues which are required for the superheater elements to go back in in due course. We, that's still a work in progress. In, in lowering the boiler some of the things that you don't think about is alteration of piping to, re to fit the new configuration of things having dropped going across. So there's been a lot of alteration to pipe work around to make it to make it fit within the gauge. If you look at the tyres in here, we've had to have, have them all professionally um, re-profiled. Re um, the South African profile, Rhodesian profile, is a much flatter profile than, than we have, so that has meant dropping all of the wheels out of the locomotive. Most of them were done at the hut shops, hut railway workshops, but the, the, major, the, the big drivers were actually done at the Glenbrook Vintage Railway in Auckland. These pipes here are all the superheater elements and they go, they fit in from the header down inside the flues, as you see, the, which are the big tubes in the boiler. This, this loco, we would like, like to think that, that realistically with another year to 18 months, we'll see it operational. The longer term int intention is to get it operating on the, out on the main line, um, but that may take some time to get through the, the registration process which involves Kiwi Rail and, and uh, New Zealand Transport Agency. Once a depot had been set up in Upper Hutt, a number of excursions were organised around locations in the Lower North Island. One of these was a regular trip to Carterton in conjunction with the New Zealand Cancer Society. This transported hundreds of kids to a daffodil festival, making it a forerunner to several children's themed steam excursions these days, such as on-track events, Wizarding Express Train and the North Pole Express. I have been privileged to have performed with both of these later excursions. However, the daffodil trip was sponsored by the Breeze radio station, and one of their announcers, Grant Walker, went along to describe how it unfolded. I got the opportunity to go on the Cancer Society's Breeze Daffodil Express Day excursion to the Carterton Daffodil Festival. And I'd like to tell you a bit about the effort that went into the preparation and running of this trip. It pretty much started after a late decision was made to bring the steam locomotive J1211, known as Gloria, down from Auckland. This came about because the Wellington-based engine, AB663, that was going to do the excursion and that had hauled the train on the previous two occasions, was suddenly needed in Christchurch to work on a train to Greymouth on the same weekend. So on the Thursday afternoon prior to the trip, J1211 left Auckland as part of freight train 225 and after travelling all through the night, eventually arrived in Wellington at 7.30 the next morning. It's now Saturday morning at Transrail's Wellington Loco Depot and a team from Mainline Steam has just arrived and are giving the engine a good clean, firing it up and checking it all over, ready for its 8.30 departure tomorrow morning. It was originally coal-fired but was converted to burn oil in the mid-1990s, similar to other J-Class Locos who have been converted during service with the New Zealand Railways. So tomorrow morning, all, when we get here, all we're going to do is light up and do the oil cups. Yeah. yeah. So tomorrow morning, you can light this up, and I'll just end up watching. Twenty minutes before we're ready to go, with the first passengers having already arrived, the engine backs down from the loco depot and is coupled to the rest of the train. Steam locos seem to attract plenty of attention. Today is no exception.
with a lot of hiss and a little bit of roar, today's adventure finally gets underway for the 500 passengers as the Daffodil Express, comprising of 10 carriages and two power vans, moves away from platform number eight. Gathering speed along the harbour foreshore past the Naronga station, we'll soon be making our first stop at Waterloo station in the Hutt Valley to pick up more passengers. Slowing down to come into the Upper Hutt station, we'll be picking up more passengers and attaching two Transrail diesel locomotives up the front to take us through the long Rimutaka Tunnel to Featherstone. We're looking out at a view that's only been seen by a railway traveller since 1955. Before this, a rail journey to the Wairarapa involved a torturous trip up to the summit of the Rimutaka Ranges, then down the famous Fell Incline to the now abandoned township of Cross Creek. The line then continued winding down a short valley and then alongside the ranges to where it joined the present track at Speedy's Road Crossing, which you'll see us passing shortly. After 80 years of operation, the Fallon Klein route was replaced by a shorter one with two tunnels, including the 8-kilometre-long Rimutaka Tunnel we've just come through. For safety reasons, because of its length, we've got the diesels up the front with the steam engine. They'll be coming off shortly at Featherston, and we'll wait there until we come back later this afternoon. Local bands out to welcome us as we come into Carterton. It's not very often you get this when travelling by train.
There's buses waiting to take us out to Middle Run Farm, about 10 k's out of Carterton, where there's a paddock of daffodils just waiting to be picked. The empty train now heads off to Masterton and brings out plenty of local inhabitants coming to watch the action. It's time for the engine to head back onto the south end of the train, next to my carriage, and it'll shortly come back to Carterton and wait for us to arrive back to the station. Carterton Station was built over 100 years ago and has recently been restored by a group of enthusiastic locals to its former glory and it now contains a small museum of local and railway history. It's a messy job, but someone has to do it. Greasing all the moving parts will help ensure that we make it back to Wellington without any mishaps. The weary and some not so weary passengers return to the station 
and take their seats while waiting for the scheduled 3.30 departure of the train. Long we come down the hill onto the flat at Upper Hut, where the two diesel engines are uncoupled and sent off ahead of us to Wellington. At last, and a few minutes early, we come into Platform 9 at the Wellington Railway Station. And for me and the other passengers, this is the end of the line and the day's outing. Today may be over for us, but it will be still a while before the engine crew can rest up as the engine needs to have another drink at the loco depot before running backwards to its shed at Upper Hut. It's just gone dark by the time the engine and its weary crew arrive home, and after a little bit of shunting to get the engine to the right end of the row of wagons outside its shed, it's time to put it away until it needs to be fired up for its next memorable excursion.
Mainline Steam's locomotives have operated from all parts of the country, and Ian's loco Sharon Lee is no exception. This locomotive was sent down to Christchurch, as mentioned in the last film, and while there it ran a weekend excursion to Greymouth. During my own trip to National Park, I was fortunate enough to be able to ride in the cab. Now I can tell you this is an exhilarating experience, which the next film will give you a bit of an idea to. Our journey from coast to coast starts at Christchurch in New Zealand's South Island, crosses a wide plain and wends its way through steep mountain valleys before reaching the river port of Greymouth. We're now onto the broad Canterbury Plains and we'll soon be climbing up mountain valleys to reach the summit of the line at Arthur's Pass. This trip was first made possible in 1923 with the opening of the Oteira Tunnel and is now considered one of the great train journeys of the world. With steam locomotive servicing facilities long since gone, water has to be pumped from a stream near the Springfield station to replenish the tender and tank wagon before the long climb to Arthur's Pass. Splendid views of snow-covered mountains create an enduring scene and serve as a backdrop for passengers' photos. As the train begins to thread its way up the Waimakariri River Valley, the mountains close in and we begin piercing through a series of tunnels, crossing deep ravines and high steel viaducts and entering narrow, steep-sided gullies.
Leaving the tunnels and viaducts behind, we climb the steep Avoca bank before the way ahead opens out into a broad alpine plateau. It's little wonder that ever since the line was opened, passenger trains through this rugged mountain region have coined the name Transalpine. Once wagons loaded with stock and wool left from Craggyburn, where we are now waiting for a coal train from Nakawal to pass. The excursion will pass many coal trains during the weekend, each hauling nearly 2,000 tonnes of black West Coast real estate to Littleton for shipping overseas. Temperatures plummet as the weather deteriorates in this inhospitable terrain, allowing us to see a different perspective to the majesty of the mountains rising high above us. station flashing past on the left has been a railway maintenance base since the opening of the line and still remains to ensure that the railway keeps operating in this harsh environment. The line rejoins the Waimakariri River again near Mount White after a deviation during the last few kilometres of our journey. Nearing Coralin, the grade begins to steepen as the train commences its final climb to the highest point of the line at Arthur's Pass. can recall the drama of the age of steam as the driver guides the train skillfully during the final slog up to Arthur's Pass. engine was originally coal-fired, but was converted to oil burning during its restoration in the mid-1990s, 
much to the relief of its farmer. We arrive at Arthur's Pass and will soon be descending through the eight kilometre long Otira Tunnel to the west coast. This tunnel through the main divide, completed in 1923, was bored under thousands of feet of solid rock and a small lake. It was the longest in the southern hemisphere at the time and slopes downhill towards Otira at a grade of 1 in 33. Electric locomotives were used through the tunnel up until the late 1990s to haul passenger and freight trains. For safety reasons, diesel locomotives will now be placed at the front of the train and the steam engine will have its fire put out. Shunting manoeuvres are required to place our tank wagon between the diesel and steam locomotives, allowing time for passengers to breathe the fresh mountain air and get photos at the highest railway station in the South Island. We're now descending through the Otira Tunnel and will soon reach the old railway town of Otira, once the depot for the electric locomotive. The steam engine's fire is restarted, the diesel locomotives removed and the tank wagon placed back behind the steam engine in readiness for us to continue our journey. Before we leave, the engine gets another drop of water. A bit of grease and oil for the bearings, and the passengers can once again stretch their legs before the train begins its dramatic run down the Otira Gorge. Another of the many daily coal trains is waiting for us at Aikens as we race past its two diesel locomotives and 24 wagons. The diesel engines that brought us down the Otira Tunnel will be placed onto the front of this coal train to assist it up through the steep tunnel. The valley begins to widen as we reach the Taramakau River, which is covered light blue by the melting snows from high up in the southern Alps. We're about to pass by the historic Jackson's Tavern that was originally built in 1870 as a horse stable for a stagecoach service to Arthur's Pass that operated before the opening of the railway. Darkness closes in on the train as it races downward towards the river port of Greymouth. The passengers will stay overnight in a hotel near the railway station and rejoin the train for the return journey early tomorrow morning. In 2006, Sharon Lee was back in the South Island again, this time taking part in the centennial celebrations for the Dunedin railway station. 
This next film gives some beautiful aerial shots along the popular scenic railway up the Taieri Gorge. In 2006, a celebration was held to mark the 100 years since the opening of the Dunedin Railway Station, and 663 went south to take part in the festivities. Being back at one of her old stamping grounds was enough of an excuse to run her back up the Tyree Gorge on the Otago Central Railway. passengers like me turn up to the platform and hop on the train. Not quite like that for the rest of the crew though. Of course there is a huge effort behind the scenes, such as today where all around me there are people cleaning carriages and getting the steam pressure up for a trip happening in two days. This next film shows the excitement of the train both on board and off. On overnight excursions, the crew are up at first light to fire up the boiler and lubricate the moving parts on the loco in readiness for the day's journey. The Napier Kiwi Rail locomotive depot is some distance from where the passengers are. It will take some time to reverse the train back to the station.
Today, the train will be full with additional local passengers having bought tickets to be part of what may be the final passenger rail journey on this line. Here, railway enthusiasts have restored and preserved the tiny station precinct at Waipongna. <laughs> From here, the railway continues its steep climb up the Esk Valley and will soon reach the first of the seven tunnels we'll pass through before arriving at Wairoa. These railway sidings at Waikawao are now the only remaining trace that was once a large sawmilling plant in operation, along with a thriving community. I've come to New Zealand because it's a beautiful country. I've been interested in steam trains ever since I was a young fellow. This is the last bastion of the real authentic steam tour. When I was 17 I worked for the railways in the, in the goods office, that's actually when we had a very active railway business operating. As a young girl, most of the men that worked in the backyard clearing and filling the wagons, they were rough and ready lot but they, they certainly looked after us. This broken country required numerous viaducts to make this railway possible, and the high barriers were essential to prevent trains being blown over the side.
We've already passed over three high steel viaducts, and this one, crossing the Mohaka River, is not only the highest on this line, but also the highest in New Zealand. The government of the day were very proud of their achievements in respect to the Napier to Gisborne Railway, and Robert Semple, the Minister of Public Works at the time, noted during his speech at the opening of the line that the Mohaka viaduct contained 1,900 tonnes of steel, was completed in record time, and was an outstanding example of what New Zealand engineers and builders can do. It's 275 metres long, and the deck we're on sits 95 metres above the water, and there's still one more steel viaduct to cross before we reach Wairoa. Approaching today's destination at Wairoa, we feel saddened that this may be the very last passenger train to arrive here. This railway line has been under threat of closure for some years now, and two substantial washouts occurring during a storm earlier in the year have led to the closure of the northern part of the line. After a review of the future potential of the line, Kiwi Rail announced just before this trip departed that it planned to mothball the railway north of Napier before the end of 2012. This little bit of equipment here on the tender is helping to re-rail the train if it comes off. And I've just noticed here that it says Fellows Brothers Limited, Engineers, Cradley Heath, England. That's where I come from. Yeah, it's all your fault that we're enjoying ourselves here. Well, I know, I, it's a terrible responsibility. Yeah. I remember going to hang myself a couple of times. One of the best things about my excursion was getting to see parts of this beautiful country that you never get to see from the road. Not only this, but you have the freedom to get up out of your seats, walk around, check out the beautiful viewing platform, and even get a snack from the food bar. This next film is of a trip from Greymouth to Westport. 
and whilst most of it does follow beside the roads, there are many stretches that don't. Remnants just across the road are of the Dobson coal mine, and it was one of a number alongside the river around here. This mine was the last, and it closed in 1968, with very little remaining. However, this old film footage gives some idea of its size. The Brunner mine on the other side of the river was the largest underground coal mine in New Zealand and the suspension bridge built in 1876, along with the preserved remains of a few buildings, are all that is left of this once busy place. Just up ahead is a 3,500 tonne canary, the last gold dredge remaining of more than 300 that worked around different parts of New Zealand. It was reconstructed from the dredge seen in this rare film, which after having recovered 202,000 ounces of gold, finished working in 1978 in the Taramakau River, just south of Greymouth. During my filming trip here in 2003, I saw the new dredge working at Nahiri and managed to get permission to film it up close as it was on this side of the river at that time. It was closed down in 2004 after it used up its allocated permit area and was moved to the other side in 2009, exhausting its permit two years later. It dug up about 120,000 tonnes of gravel each week, from which it would recover about 120 ounces of gold. Maybe a future candidate for an interesting museum, it now sits idle as it awaits whatever its fate may be. Turning eastward out of the Grey Valley, the locus starts attacking the grade up to the Reefton Saddle, the only hill we'll encounter on the line through to Westport. When gold was discovered on the west coast in the 1860s, fortune seekers flocked from around the globe. Reefton was laid out around 1870 after reefs of gold bearing quartz were discovered in the surrounding hills. It has a population of about a thousand and is still a busy mining town with both gold and coal mines in the vicinity. Underground mining for gold was a tough life, as shown in these very early film clips taken in a mine just to the south of Beethoven. The quartz rock had to be broken down in the mine, then brought out in small trucks hauled by pit ponies before being pulverised by stampers. And put in chemical tanks to separate the gold from the quartz. In 1888, Reefton became the first town in the Southern Hemisphere to have reticulated power and street lighting. A hydroelectric plant was built. 
Broadway, Briefton's main street, was lit by electric lamps and the future looked bright. The railway yard is still a busy place, with a local group restoring the engine shed and station, gold-bearing concentrate being transported in these wagons to Otago, and a couple of local coal mines having loading facilities at the north end of the yard. for a coal train to pass at Cronodon, one carriage is quiet, while in another we have a less than quiet party with one very young passenger celebrating a second birthday with some friends. Many of the rail bridges along this section of track were used by road traffic as well, and the old road paving approaching this one can clearly be seen. This archive film from the 1950s shows the wooden trush bridge that spanned this stream along with a small station shelter, both of which are now very much a thing of the past. We're passing through the Anangahua railway yard that was once busy with coal and timber being loaded into wagons for transporting out. Crossing over the Anangahua river, we see the valley which starts at Lake Rotawiti near Nelson and on the other side of the Bola river, we'll turn west and follow it through to Westport.
we get a somewhat wet but friendly welcome after what has been a great second day on the rails. Kia ora, Grant. Hi, how are you? Yeah, I'm very well, thanks. Thanks for coming and uh, having a chat today. So I've got a, a few questions. I hear you've organised an amazing full carriage fleet around the three depots that you're still working on. Once that's all put in place, what kind of ideas do you have for trips? Yeah, you're right. And that's across now Auckland, Wellington and Christchurch Depot. Our, our goal is to have three full operational um, carriage fleets, such yeah. as one well, we're sitting at the present point of time. So, so yeah, and what that gives us is a, a nice uh, train that we can you know, provide a very good customer experience for our passengers and our customers. And you know we've we found some success in running out of Wellington here, where we've been travelling to a destination where we can get our passengers off the train. Uh, they can experience a nice occasion, such as, a, as a lunch or some other sort of event. So we sort of have been running trips, you know, the Wellington to the, the Tui Brewery, the Chateau, and recently one to Napier. So and we've all times taken the people off the, the train and, and you know provided a meal for them. So at a destination, so that. Uh, experience seems to be working well. It's been a you know, pretty good success out of Wellington, so we've seen no reason why that wouldn't continue mm. um, at the other two depots. So, I've heard a bit about overnight journeys as well. It's something we've we've done a few in the past, mainly around tours. Where we've been running tours with either uh, national or international customers that we've we've brought in for a, a rail tour. So a nice venue like the Chateau, you know, would would appeal, I believe, to um, a broad range of, of customers. So. Um, and I guess if you find a destination like the Chateau, you know, um, for those that may be happy to stay like in Awakuni at a, a more motel hotel, you know, that gives us an option for to, to look after that sort of part of the, the, the um, customer experience as well. I really enjoyed the Chateau when I went there, so I can definitely imagine that being an amazing overnight experience. Yes. And of course, you can't get much better than the West Coast, so that does sound incredible. It does, Absolutely. yeah. Absolutely. Yes, the West Coast offers a whole lot of different features in that. And yeah, the, the trip to the West Coast, obviously, you know, mm. throughout this past, it's spectacular. And yeah there's, yeah, there's plenty of activities on the West Coast to have really. their custom samples. So. Really exciting stuff. Of course, we've got amazing carriages already in this Wellington facility. So, can you tell us a little bit about these current renovated carriages? The carriages we have in Wellington and, uh, and also the, the fleet we, we have in Christchurch, they uh, ex New Zealand Railways, Kiwi Rail, as the Overland or the, the Transalpine used on those, plus some other local sort of maybe trains that might have run to Marston on time. So they've all required some form of renovation, restoration, some not, not too much more than, than a good tidy up and a paint job. Others um, have required pretty, pretty well a full rebuild. I guess learned a lot as we've gone through. It'd be fair to say, I mean, most of these carriages were built in the late 30s, early 40s, and modernised by. Um, New Zealand Railways through the, um, the late 80s and the 90s. Uh, they're a nice carriage. The, you know, the upgrades that was done, air conditioning, heating, uh, 230 volt electricity, uh, means we can run a very good buffet car with good chillers, you know, microwaves, ovens, which enables us to provide you know, quite a wide range of hot and cold drinks and hot and cold food. But this, the seating's nice. The tables are, are good to, to sit there and, you know, with your drink or read a book or read a magazine and, and we've got these glorious big windows here that just give you such a good vista of, of New Zealand's lovely countryside. I have to say from my own experience, um, acting on the steam train, it's wonderful to be in a beautiful air-conditioned space, yep. um, but to know that it is an amazing original from the 40s that just has the facilities of a modern carriage. And of course the tables, it makes you feel like you're always in first class. Yes. It's very nice. Yeah. No, well, thank you. It is. And look, we're proud of them and we do our best to yeah. present them well. And we have a good uh, volunteer base. Um, our carriage attendants spend a lot of time preparing the train Absolutely. inside. And then um, you know, we, we, we wash and clean them and do obviously all our pre-checks, you know, mechanical checks prior to going out. So yeah, we, we're proud of them and we, we, you know, we do our best to present them as absolutely best condition as possible. Can you talk a little bit about that organising and preparing that goes into an excursion, such as the work by the volunteers dealing with Kiwi Rail yep. and the kind of work that you've of course put in today. Yep. So yeah, it's so we'll I guess it, I'll go right back to the start when we will come up with a, a destination that we would like to run to, and um, so the, the the leadership team will will uh, agree on a destination, like Napier for example, and. Um, 
And we'll typically do that, you know, three, minimum three, six, sometimes six to eight months in, in advance. And um, uh, our first work we have to do is obviously let Kiwi Rail know, send in a timetable, send in an application to, to run the trip. So um, it's Kiwi Rail's network, so we need permission to run on their railway and, and obviously get a, get a crew uh, to run the steam locomotives. So, so the Kiwi Rail part of the work is done very early on. Um, the planning and the application is we'll, we'll go about marketing the trip, setting the pricing, advertising via our social media, our website, um, newspaper advertising if need be. Uh, so we'll start the marketing, you know, three about three months out, selling tickets. But as the trip approaches, we'll get our team involved a similar amount of time, two, well, well, two to three days at minimum to clean it. We usually bring the steam locomotive into steam two days, maybe three days in advance, just to gradually bring the port up to pressure, get it nice and warm. So, so usually by the, you know, the the last day of the day, probably we're going away, um, everything's set, we're confident everything's ready to go, and it's just sort of final work. What do you think are some of your favourite landscapes or the most spectacular views that you've seen on any of your trips? Well, the, the matter of two gorges obviously are very, very good. I guess it's, it's an attraction now because there's no road through anymore with the, the road being closed and so people can't experience it other than if they want to walk it through the walking track and the other way is by rails. Running up onto the central plateau, the the, the great rivers, the uh, the nice trees, bridges we go across, and then obviously up on the central plateau with the, the vista of the mountains. It's you know on a nice day, it's spectacular. It's uh, it's a very very nice part of the, the country. And the run out of Flemington here is is very nice. We've got a nice climb up out of Flemington up onto Pukegura Bay, and then as we we go around the coast there, looking out towards Kapiti Island, heading towards Pukekohe and and Aparumu. Spectacular views on the coastline. There's some, you know, nice elevated. Uh, the tracks are reasonably elevated up above the sea. So, I don't know, you know, on a nice evening or a nice crisp, clear morning, the views are very good. I had an amazing time myself going up to the national park, and even uh, recently going towards, I think it was. Uh, or Tucky, um, we went over an, an amazing um, gorge or river, and we pretended that it was the portal going yep. into the, you know, going yep. into the North yep. Pole. But I mean, you can do that when there's just such magical, um, spectacular views mm. that you get. Yeah, and you, yeah. And you get quite a, you know, a different perspective of New Zealand scenery with um, rail travel. Yeah, it's you know opens up part of the countryside you can't normally see unless you're going by train. So you know we're we're blessed in New Zealand with very nice scenery and spectacular views. I've heard a little bit about the trip to Napier last November. So can you discuss the highlights about that trip to Napier? As the first time we've been across the east coast for quite some time, so Napier was on our radar to try and do. So. So yeah, we a reasonably short notice we put a put a trip together there and we found a nice venue in Napier called the Old Church.
steamed from Palmerston to, to Napier and the, it was a trip that not many of us had done for for quite some time so it was nice to, to continue on through the Manitou Gorge and we headed up the East Coast line to, to Napier so yeah, it was a nice run. and that we went across around Ormondville and there was some spectacular scenery there. You know, when you can sit back out the windows and watch the countryside, it's, it's hard not to, to smile. We live in a special place. was very nice. It was a, an old historic church on the outskirts of Napier that you know catered us for us very nice with a nice lunch and you know provided a nice and pleasant experience. Mm -hmm. So lovely vineyards around it. So yeah, it was nice rolling down into through Hastings into Napier there and nice to, to get the steam train back there. So we had a very pleasant day. So, long day. Yeah, it was pleasant.
the uh, slightly different destination from where we'd been running for the last 18 months was was uh, was ideal so yeah we'd, we'd, we'd like to go back there again uh, probably this year if not in 2020 so well thank you so much for coming and chatting no problem my pleasure thank you very much so. yeah